This is uh, clearly a good and efficient way of producing a carbohydrate. Yes. I, I used to do this, but I've gone back to a, a, a more primitive way of cooking the cattail, which I think gives it a, a much better flavour. It may be more the sort of thing that hunters might do if they were out in the marsh here looking for some deer or something. They could cook something very quickly. <laughs> Inside the skin is a spongy layer. Two. And basically, this comes up already. You just stick it straight in the embers. Two. And you toast it until it's black. Get it very hot. And it really improves the flavour, softens it, and 
if you can get past the stings, but they need heating before eating, and that's normally done by boiling. <coughs> One of the things that we're going to have a little play with are the nettles. Our ancestors didn't have a cooking pot. They could have taken a bath vessel, put water in it, and dropped it in the and bring it to the boil, but it's an awful lot of work. In my mind, even though nettles are good eating, I'm not convinced that they're actually worth the time, unless you've got some meat to put in there as well. So, the other thing I'm trying is just try to work them over the fire. Four. Yeah, and then you see how it is done. Oh, if you can do that, it works. I'm confident that we can work them over the heat, but then how palatable are that kind of thing. Six. As long as you them long, keeping them long like this, you can control them on the fire. It doesn't take much work. Just very quick. Eight. Oxidizes the formic acid of the stings. All in all, an abundant toastable snack. <laughs> so one depends on their knowledge of their environment. So to understand the bigger picture of our ancient diet, Gordon and I need to build up an idea of our ancestral surroundings. To do that, we must travel back over 7,000 years to the Middle Stone Age. Four. Metal. Six. In body holes covering a prehistoric lake, Dr. Steve Warren from the Seven. University of Cambridge has just such a time machine for exploring ancient Eight. landscapes. Eight. So what we're going to do is copy it, uh, and that really is a meter long Eight. void in the uh, barrel. Ten. Okay, so you want to start with it? Up to come. 
So here we are, we've got this strange pole going into the ground, and on the end of it we've got a tube that is gradually taking samples, metre by metre, as we go down into this, this mire here, this boggy ground. And um, roughly here, it's estimated at about a metre every thousand years. So we're going back towards the Mesolithic now, very close to the Mesolithic. We're already into the period of farming in Britain. And it's quite exciting, although we're not going to see a great deal other than mud. We will at least be touching mud from that period that we're interested in. I, I think that's quite evocative, really. <laughs> We've come to the heart of our investigation. We're about to touch the plants of our plants. It's a unique experience. Well, we'll bring the horizontal way if you can catch it. It's the one. There we are. Okay, and then the mosaic. This muddy core has various shades which record climatic influences like the ordered pages of a book, from the pale sandy deposits of the Ice Age to the rich dark humus of the Mesolithic yeah. solid down here. So what we know then is up here, this, this area here is going to be the Mesolithic here. So, we the Mesolithic. so when, when this silt was deposited, the Britons were still hunter gatherers. Absolutely. I find that amazing. That's the closest we're going to get. I'm actually touching what was laid down at that time. It's amazing, isn't it? It's so well preserved. And what have you found over the years when you've been studying the course on this site? Um, if you're lucky, um, particularly on the edge of this site, you can actually come up with a hazelnut from the Mesolithic in a core like this. And that's a fantastic moment when you split the core open and there's a, a, the remains of a plant, perhaps a leaf or a seed or a bud scale um, from the plant five, six, seven, eight thousand years ago. That's amazing. If I try and swing this cold, I'll have a look inside it. Certainly very sandy on the end here. Two. It's what you can see by the glacier. And then, and then we come up here, Three. suddenly the lake sediment becomes very organic. So we've got a warmer, wetter environment. Four. Absolutely. So this material is very sandy, so I'm not going to taste it. This material, this organic material, um, almost entirely turned up to the remains Six. of the plant from the animal material, and uh, if I put it in my mouth and taste it, it's more crazy than that. There's certainly no sand in there, and that very, very fine grain. Because there's no sand, at least, the wind can't blow it in. I think the, the soils here are now stabilised by vegetation, by forests, um, and what we have here is a debris deposited at the bottom of a three, four, even five metre deep lake. Right, I think that's it. No sand at all. It's um, clay. It's, it's, um, it's very smooth. It's very pasty. Seven. It's incredible. We're eating plant matter from the Mesolithic. Stuff most archaeologists see in natural world. That would probably be the weirdest thing to eat in this city. Right. <laughs> These are plants our hunter gatherer ancestors Ten. knew. They are identities in the form of pollen grains, thousands of years old, yet still right. intact, can be extracted from the core. We get a very tiny uh, residue, put it on the side, look at it down the microscope, and Amazingly, you can see pollen grains and you can recognize the different types of pollen grains and match them to plants which grow around here today. We can start to build a picture from, from, from those, those pollen leaves of what the larger parts of the vegetation were. It's a fantastic technique for giving you an idea of what the landscape in the area around this lake would have been like. They're amazing. Pollen core samples from across Britain tell us that there are several trees which dominated wetland edges as the climate warms. Three. First pine, and then birch are recorded. Then thousands of years later, hazel, oak, elm, and alder. By exploring similar environments today, we can fill Six. in the possible shrubs and flowering plants. But for the detail of what Mesolithic Britons were actually using, we have to turn to extremely rare finds, seeds or roots, which have survived thousands of years because of charring. This is when Gordon 
is in his element. What happens is that when something small and dense hits a fire, if it trickles through the fire and it isn't burnt to ash itself, as all the light components would be, then it has a chance of being smothered by the ashes at the bottom of the fire and preserved by charring. To most people, this is just a small black seed, but to Gordon, it's an identity riddle, one that can be solved using his extensive seed archive. You have to use often quite a subtle feature to distinguish one from another. And you have no hope of doing this except by comparing them very closely under the microscope with modern equivalents. Gordon's built this up over 30 years of gathering. And without this amazing collection, our study of ancient wild foods would be impossible. What we have here under the microscope now are some of these rare remains from a Mesolithic site, hung together a site called Mount Sandal in Northern Ireland. The pattern of cells of the, the, the upper end here of this uh, seed is diagnostic of, of the white water lily. But of course, we also get the yellow water lily turning up on these sites, and sites in Denmark and Germany. So this is clearly something that was used as food then. But of course, we're having to work with miserable little uh, fragments of the pot that can't size the whole, the whole picture clearly. So to flesh out the archaeology, we have to look elsewhere. And we've been lucky enough to spend time with Australian Two. Aboriginals who still eat water lily seeds. Four. At the end of the day, though, it comes down to trying them at home. Fresh yellow water lily seeds are incredibly bitter, eaten raw or roasted. But we've read of the Klamath tribe in Oregon who would ferment their seeds, so we're going to try that. It's an unusual method, but it's an efficient way to collect the seeds which sink as the pods rot away over several days. mimics the natural ripening process and means the seeds should be far less bitter. Dead hemlock stems. We might not think to use this for fire lighting and uh, certainly one wants to try using a green because it's so poisonous but when it's dead it's alright. In Lapland, the Sami, when they go up into the mountains, 
they carry with them dead angelica stalks, which are very similar to this. And the reason being is they burn good and hot, and they're very light, so they can easily carry with them what they need to make their very far while they're out looking after the reindeer. Well, here we have it, Ray. Clean feed. Look at that. Well, that's a good harvest. Well, we're in business, aren't we? We are indeed. Very crazy. We're going to need some leaves, aren't we, as well? Yes, we will. Yeah. Uh, what do you reckon? Well, I saw some of this jar of water dock. Yeah, that's, 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 that's an ideal there. Yeah. I'll grab a couple of those. They're non toxic and they're big. Yeah. so many leaves that we could use to do the same jobs <sighs> to all alternative methods that are usually better than more fun and more tasty and uh, non-polluting. Good nettle here actually go on this I think this one may give us all the string we need. Actually. Now this uh, way of getting the fibres out isn't something I learned from any sort of book. I just sat down all day and played with nettles until it presented itself. aren't as arbitrary as they look. With a bit of experience you can judge things very finely and fire is one of the things I find really interesting. Is fire is not just simple, it's not just the fire. You know, I've made the right type of fire for this type of cooking. It's quite small but I've got good hot embers and I've chosen firewood that will give us good ash so that I've got a lot of ash around that are reduces the oxygen and the risk of everything being consumed by the fire. So the fire is actually a very sophisticated I'm looking at that, looking up, looking close, and it's going to spin. So it's not gone hard inside, it's going to stay stuck. Yeah. Which I'm not surprised because it's going to be steaming. No. Last time I came back, it was actually good, didn't it? Stringent bitterness, 
Imagine a time when the British landscape wasn't shaped by man. But in the Mesolithic, we were still one influence amongst many, which included birds of wild horses and ancient auric. There is evidence which could suggest humans burnt reed beds. Certainly, open fenland like this would have been a prime hunting ground, which gained tended out of colour by fresh green shoots. there was another animal who was an important architect of our ancient landscape, the beaver. They fell trees, but only used the branches for their dams and lodges. The timber they leave behind would have been easy pickings for people who otherwise had only stone axes to cut down trees. Beaver coppice the woodland edge and create waterways through it. 
making flooded forests which have an abundance of wild foods, especially in the spring. In Britain, what used to be the work of beavers now has to be done by man. These precious reserves are so small, without management, they would dry up and disappear. What? special in the past. We can't take eggs for granted, but if you're foraging for them, 
there are only uh, a few birds that could give you eggs throughout the year, things like pigeons. When it comes to goose's eggs like this, this was very much a seasonal delicacy. And you can imagine our ancestors waiting in anticipation for the arrival of the geese in the winter. It meant a lot of things. It meant a, a fat, rich bird to be eaten during the winter. And then when spring came along, they'd have been watching very eagerly. And the children were up looking, gathering the eggs, bring them back and cook them. It's quite like that people sat around and fish in this way, a bit of a feast. To be honest with you, out here, the temperature, the ambient temperature, the wind, the type of embers that we're burning, the dryness of the fire, that all has an effect. So the only way to know is to watch. Yeah. And, but as a, as a rough guide, I, I guess, if you want, something 40 minutes, something like that, 30, 40 minutes is, is, is about right. So you want to be cooking it slowly. The egg's about ready to take out now, so I just... When I take it out, it's, it's going to continue cooking because it's very hot. I'm glad you're putting it in your side, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> it's going to go off. Might as well go off in a useful direction. <laughs> this one's ready to do it. This one's ready to do it. Yeah, this, one, this one's ready. I really, really like the direct sort of cooking, you know, it's straight into the fire. And you get to taste the ingredients, you know, in a purest state of note package. You know. And then, well, there we are. It's nicely cooked. Okay. Thank you. So, I'll tell you what I really like about these the flowers, especially when they're this plum and they haven't quite opened.
which is man-made, but one of the principles of bushcraft is to know where and how to find the natural equivalents. Release one of the village elders, and so we are happy to show how they sleep when they're away from the village. I'm setting up quite a, an elaborate lightweight camp because I'm going to be here a few days. Well, it's just here overnight and I can go to all these lengths. And the first job normally is that the roof goes up because it's pouring with rain. We can then work completely freely in the dry beneath it. And that's very important because when it's raining very hard, it's very difficult to think straight. The rain pounding on your head means you make poor decisions and accidents are frequent in those circumstances. <laughs> sense of security like now it's not raining so you might think oh it's going to be a nice day i'll just be a bit sloppy in the way i put my camp up i guarantee if you do that two o'clock in the morning the most horrendous downpour will show all of your faults the hammock really was that simple just strips of bark not that so all seemed concerned <coughs> as a real showman <laughs> This is the way we do things. When we travel in the forest, what? we can't take our big animals from home. It's very important for us because we have to hunt and fish, and for that we have to go into the forest for many days. We can't find food in the forest, and we have no cattle ranches. We have to hunt, and for that we need a hammock to sleep in.
this is a very important tool here, but it's also worth bearing in mind that the machete or the parang is the most dangerous tool we use in bushcraft because the length of the edge is so great. There's a tremendous potential to bite us. And a few things we have to know. The first is we need to keep it sharp. So every day on a daily basis, you sharpen it. For that, I carry with me a small sharpening stone, combination stone like this. But if I didn't have that, I could use a pebble from the river. Probably the best way to show you how to use a machete is to make something. And we need a bench to go in our camp there so we can sit comfortably by the fire in the evening. And that's what I'm going to make. To start with, I cut a small stick to give me a measure for some of the pieces I'm going to need. I need to cut some strong supports. I use a measuring rod and you just put a mark on there. That's where I want to cut it. I'm going to need a point on the end. So rather than cut through and then point it, I'll do it all in one go. This is something that you can really only do with a strong stem machete. You cut like so. All ready to go. Perfect. So that's one. Rainforest saplings are fabulous building materials. They're straight and strong. And when you need rope, you just split a liana or two. For the bench as long as this, you need to put an extra support in the middle. termites and ants crawling around on the forest floor. With my camp well established, I was ready to take a better look at Kanarakuni and find out more about where Louis, Saul and Benito came from. These villages are like islands in the Pacific. That's how cut off they are from modern life. Though there were bizarre reminders everywhere of the world outside of the forest. About 120 people live here. Most of what they do is subsistence living, but they are also known for their baskets, which they trade. Everything we use comes from the rainforest. The basic material for the baskets comes from a vine. The pigment comes from a palm tree, which looks very like a banana tree. Some of the drawings from the basket are purely ornamental, but some of them have mythological meaning. According to ancient tales, there was a god on earth who kept birds. What? He sent the birds into the sky with a long string to some blue to drag the stars from the earth into the sky. Three. And that's how the stars came to be in heaven. One. Two. Bushcraft encompasses many skills and crafts. Three. A huge communal building in Kanarakuni is an impressive piece of collaborative construction. Four. Great proof of the power and skills 
and fish crafting consciousness. I've already seen how Luis and so all work together. To build this, the whole village must have helped. Canaracuni is a mixture of change and tradition. They still paint themselves for special occasions. This bakery provides the staple food, a dried bread made from manioc root. Canaracuni is There's no point trying to live by the rules and schedules of normal life when you're in the jungle. The jungle is beautiful but harsh, so you have to give yourself enough rest, liquid, and time to wash. Not that there isn't time to enjoy yourself too. At the end of each day is a nice little part of the routine which is the wash and then into your dry kit. You keep one set of clothes dry for the evening as far as dry as you can make them. And it's important when your feet have been wet all day to wash them, to powder them, to rub some light back into them. This prevents foot problems, foot rot and other conditions Six. associated with that. It's really good. It's a nice time, but very often you take so much time to sack yourself. There's absolutely no point in trying to stay dry in a rainforest. Things are just far too wet. But at the end of the day, it's really worthwhile putting on your dry clothes and these waterproof socks, well, right now my feet are already warm and toasty. logistics camp. Doesn't matter how many times you come to the rainforest, you 
you rarely see the same thing done twice. The way they set up this shelter is really interesting. They've taken flexible wow. towels and chosen to ask the roof of the kitchen. So simple, yet unique in my experience. We brought much of our food with us. It's a full-time sure. job for the people of Canary Street to feed themselves, but we did buy pineapples from them, the best I've ever tasted. One. Two. Why is this tree important to you? We use it to make it fall. Four. How do you do that? You take the latex out of the tree. To get a big bowl, you need to cut more than one tree in order to collect enough latex. Is that how these cuts came to be made? Yeah. I did it. You did it? How many years ago was that? 40 years ago. It must have been small. Yes, I remember it well. And I remember each tree we used to use. I tell the children now where they can't find the right trees to make balls because balls from the city are expensive. Talking to Louise was like having your own encyclopedia of the jungle, and he was wonderfully generous with his knowledge. How's this then, Louise? It's red sap from a vine that we use as a dye. Traditionally, it should only be collected by women who are no longer virgins. It's believed young girls coming of age might bleed to death if they do it. So it's gathered by older women who already have children and grandmothers. It's a really intense red color. It really looks like this is bleeding. You can easily understand the mythology associated with it. If I put my hands down, you might think I've cut myself. Very strong. comes from the forest, Eight. including their fishing rods. Luis used the fire to harden the rod, a technique I've seen indigenous people use all around the world. Where I come from, people will often spend whole week's wages to buy a fishing rod. The other thing that happens, Luis, is that they catch fish and then they throw them back into the river once they've caught them. What do you think of that? So they're throwing the money out of the window. <laughs> and they probably go to the shop and buy the fish anyway. <laughs> Next morning, we had to empty the boats before an early start. Fishing today, and as always, these events, it's a whole family affair. 
like this, you realize what noise pollution is. Twenty-five, baby. 